Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Feel free to grab your food, sandwiches, and lunch. Uh, my name is Steve Allison, and I'm the director of the Newkirk Center for Science and Society. I'm very pleased to be here with you today uh, for the next lecture in our faculty fellows uh, seminar series. And I want to thank the uh, Newkirk family, Martha and James Newkirk, for uh, supporting the Newkirk Center and making this all possible. Um, also, Jamie Matsuno Rich for organizing the logistics. Uh, and thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, the Faculty Fellows Program is a, a new initiative uh, for this uh, academic year. And uh, the, the goal here is to feature some of the wonderful work going on around the, the UCI campus by our faculty scholars uh, from all different disciplines. And today we'll hear from the arts, uh, we've heard from the sciences, and we'll hear from the uh, medicine and the social sciences uh, as we go out uh, through these, these uh, seminars. So we have a cohort of uh, 10 fellows and we're about midway through, I think this is our fourth uh, lecture, and then we'll pause for the summer and uh, come back in the fall for, for some more uh, lectures. So today I'm very pleased to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Jesse Colin Jackson, uh, who is a Canadian artist and designer uh, based here in Southern California. Um, he's a professor at UCI and he's a professor of electronic art and design in the uh, Claire Trevor School of the Arts, where he's also associate dean and um, research and innovation, uh, oh, associate dean of research and innovation and the executive director of the Beale Center for Art and Technology. Uh, so his works uh, focus on the architectures that we construct from buildings to landscapes to virtual worlds through objects and images made with digital visualization and fabrication technologies. Uh, he often collaborates intensively with scientists, humanists, and other uh, creative folks. He has uh, a work called Marching Cubes, uh, which is performances and installations that have been featured across Canada, the US, Mexico City, Stockholm, Tehran, uh, and other places around the world. Solo exhibitions of his work have been reviewed by the LA Review of Books and the Globe and Mail. And in 2016, he edited Urban Ecologies 2013, which examined the impact of emerging categories of research and practice that are shaping the future of our cities. And currently he's editing Experimental Engagements in Inter Interdisciplinary Art, an anthology of contemporary practices, and that'll be coming out in 2024. Um, I'll also mentioned that he's been collaborating with uh, Folks in my department, which is ecology and evolutionary biology, on an art and science uh, collaboration, a collaborative space uh, that's located out at the Burns Pinion uh, UC Natural Reserve in the desert. So I think we might hear a little bit about that uh, today as well. So let's welcome uh, Jesse and look forward to seeing what you have to, to show us. Thanks, Stephen. Um, and thank you all for coming and to the Newkirk Center for inviting me. This program has been wonderful. Uh, in the arts, we, we call this crossing the bridge. If you've ever been to the School of the Arts, we have a bridge that connects us to the rest of campus. And, and, and as much as we try, sometimes it's hard. I mean, there's so many things happening on campus. It's not always easy to connect with the rest of campus. And so the, I think this initiative is helping many of us connect in ways we never um, imagined. Um, I'm here to talk to you about Art and Ecology in the Places We Live. I'm gonna talk about three projects, including the project out at Burns Pinion at the end. I was saying to Jessica, I am a slide. I'm an overslider. I have a lot of slides. I, if, I will skip over things if I have to, but um, without any further ado, let's start talking about some projects. Actually, there is some further ado first. I apologize. Um, so we're gonna talk about my projects for the last kind of three quarters, but I felt some not so much obligation, but desire to think about some of the words in the Newkirk Center's mandate and, and how it relates to the arts. So of course we have science at the center and society uh, kind of actually seems like a kind of natural relationship. And yet the fact that we need a center means we're struggling to make that connection sometimes. And we have the same problem in, in the arts where you know to some degree the arts exists as a world unto itself. And while we of course, prefer to have audiences, we, we are often kind of operating across the bridge on our own. And so again, I, you know, I thank the Newkirk Center and any initiative on campus that allows for interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary connection. 
and there's a kind of idealized version of this and and um, I can't help it, Stephen Barker, Dean of the School of the Arts, and I've had this conversation so many times in so many different ways. Um, you know, the, and this this notion of interdisciplinarity. We're gonna we're gonna cross those things. We're gonna make a Venn diagram that combines art and science. We'll leave society aside for the moment. Um, and this is what we might call this the inter, interdisciplinary model. So what's what happens at that intersection? Um, and I just wanted to kind of this is a thought experiment I literally came up with yesterday. What are some other models? Is this the model? This model is some, it's a little, you know, kind of tried and true, and to some degree hasn't succeeded in infiltrating the university or infiltrating the world. We still operate in disciplinary ways. Um, this might be another model where art sits at the center of science. Um, and bear with me, these are simply diagrams. Um, society, you'll notice, is always on the outside somewhere, circling around, but it's also the biggest space in the diagram. You know, it's kind of the thing that we all operate within. I call this the, N the NSF model of art science. And the National Science Foundation, we're, we're here at a national academy. Um, and so we have science front and center and then art is a thing that, and, and often in NSF collaborations, there's a, at least historically, have been a desire for artists to work kind of as illustrators. This is not a bad thing. It, it just might be an incomplete thing, you know, that we call on artists to be in conversation with science as a kind of, well, we need to show people what our science is and, and, and again, I think that's a wonderful thing to do, but I am interested in more complicated models for how art and science might operate in society. I have to lift my screen to see it here. So what if we put science in the middle of art? I, I teach a class every year, a huge 400 student class where I talk about the fact that we're organized into disciplines in the university and were art to have the same number of disciplines as science, we would have a separate sculpture department and film department and a separate painting department. And, and if we went stretched back into history, that might actually be a very, very natural thing and a kind of pre-university version of knowledge, the distribution of how people operate in the world would have far more artists actually. And, and we could have a whole lecture about that. And, and in fact, I hope Stephen can, can give us that lecture um, later. And I wanna point out that in this two-dimensional model, in this flat earth model of art and science, well, maybe science is the mountain in the middle. Maybe this is a topographic map. And in fact, science is still the thing around which art might be organized, but in a more kind of holistic way and you know, kind of a wrapper. Um, and then of course, volumetrically, science remains the kind of larger component part. That's not important, but it's just of interest um, in, the, in the volumetric model. And if we kind of play out this metaphor, you know, we note that there we need a kind of horizon and society is in fact the, you know, the ocean in which these two islands um, emerge from a kind of volcano. And where do the people live? They live around the coastline, somewhere at the art society interface with science as the kind of mountain that we're all kind of climbing. And I'm going to stop my pictures there because I think my metaphor falls apart at some point, but I wanted to introduce you to sort of some of the ways that I'm thinking about how art and science might be in conversation. I also wanted to introduce the notion of topography as something central to my work um, and the way that I'm thinking about um, the interface between art and ecology. Um, this is actually the topography just that we see Saddleback and Majeska peaks above Orange County. Um, and from there, I'm gonna to talk to you about my first project. The three projects today, Suburban Ecologies was a show that I had here in Irvine. In, you'll notice the dates though. Um, unfortunately, these dates coincided perfectly with the second wave of the pandemic. So this show never opened. This, is a, this was my largest show. It had zero audience. Um, so it's really lovely to talk about it. And I do have lots of pictures of it. It did get installed. Um, and I'm gonna start off with, I'm gonna try this little, this is me. Um, we're going to switch to to video. I have three videos to show you, which will help me be faster, more efficient. Put it that way. If they play. Uh oh. Oh boy. Oh, that's exciting. Okay, let's. <laughs> Alan. Uh, to, to, let's just see if I fail to connect. Wi Fi visitor. This, this played five minutes ago. Okay, let's try that again. Yep. 
the over. Ooh, I have to log in. Great. Okay. Didn't tell me to do that earlier. Okay, now am I logged in? Try going back to. There we go. Okay, now we're now we're really now you get to see my website. Okay. Here we go. Video. Pause that there. Um, where did my slide presentation go? Alan said, "Is never we've never had that happen to us before." Here we go. There we go. Um, to realize I actually skipped over something. I, I think a little intro to what the work looks like is helpful. You know, what's what's my interest in ecology? We talked about art and science more generally. Um, you know, ecology is concerned with the interrelationships between organisms and their environment. And for many of us, ecology connotes nature and the natural world. And, and um, I'm interested in a, my interest in ecology and in art making created in conversation with ecology stems from a, the more broader, all encompassing idea of ecology applicable to all organisms and all environment. Think of the city as an ecological system, as do many people who design cities these days. You know, they're not kind of separate from nature. And, and in fact, maybe that separation is the thing that tripped us up so much in the first place in the 20th century. I'm also interested in applying ecological ideas as a metaphor for all systems um, in attempting to express these systems in my artwork. And equally, as I'll describe in my final project, the one out at Burns Pinion, I'm interested in putting art and ecology alongside one another as an open-ended experiment with no predetermined um, results or, or, or expectations, let's just see what happens, but also with a hypothesis in mind that what will happen will perhaps transcend both disciplines. I guess it perhaps makes a bad hypothesis, but you know, um, my thinking and making are also indebted to a specific ecological idea first shared with me by Kayla Mooney, a colleague of the other ecologists in the room, although I expect you all have the same way of explaining this. 
um, he was just the first to do it to me, this notion of ecological legibility. To paraphrase, for an ecologist, the natural world around us can be read like a book, its component parts forming sentences and paragraphs that make sense. When you're out in the desert, it all makes sense. It's all working together as a system. For those of us not legible in that language or not, not taught that language, we don't necessarily understand what we're seeing. But what was fascinating to me was this idea that somebody who is trained can look at that landscape and understand it in the same way that we might read a book. Conversely, the ad hoc manner which with, with which we introduce the natural world to our built environment, the irrigated landscaping of imported soils and invasive species, or, or even the random potted plants in our homes. They're illegible. The, the words are there. They are, they are plants. There is soil, but they don't make sentences, let alone a coherent system. And um, in, in, I would argue that the same issue is true of the built environment. We understand our houses. We understand our neighborhoods, perhaps. We, necessarily, we can't parse how they integrate into the greater system of cities and the infrastructure and energy and resources that make the cities possible. A particular interest to me are the places where these two systems, the natural environment and the environments we've built, intersect and interact. I create artwork in response to these collisions. Sometimes I do this to make a point or have an impact, but often I'm simply driven by a desire to better understand and importantly kind of witness, like be part of and get myself into these systems and their collisions as they occur. So that's what these projects all have in common. Okay. So suburban ecologies, I'm gonna just, this has very little text. I'm gonna talk about three components of this exhibition. In the, in the large room in the exhibition, we were looking at um, Orange County itself and the waterfront that fronts it. And, you know, this is a great project to show this audience because you're all familiar with all of these things. If I show this in New York City, they've never, they think I'm talking about New Jersey. They get very confused and um, not such a problem here. Um, so this, in this part of the presentation, I'm actually gonna give you a kind of nuts and bolts to show you what these look like and how they're made. Um, this is our six, our coastline. You'll notice that we've divided it into the somewhat arbitrary six beach cities. Those are not important ecologically. In fact, they're kind of almost random political boundaries, but they do create a, a border that we understand. We understand there to be from um, Seal Beach to San Clemente, six cities along the Orange Coast. And so each of those places gets an image like this. It's a kind of mashup of all of the things or as many things as possible that occur along that section of coastline. Um, so this is uh, the San Clemente example. And because we're, you know, we're mostly local to here, you'll recognize some of the things you've seen, like the, you know, we know that the train passes the ocean in San Clemente and there's the San Clemente Pier. In fact, there's two of them. And the fact that the beaches are busy in Orange County. This is one of the other things I've learned from our ecologists, of course, is that the ecological systems of the beach in Orange County are comparatively dead relative to beaches that haven't been, in, you know, kind of interrupted by humans for hundreds of years. You know, there's, we, we, we try to preserve them, but really they're on their last legs in some senses. We import sand and we manipulate them and build jetties and, and, and so on. They're still beautiful places, but they're, they're not so beautiful ecologically. This is, um, Laguna Beach. And this is how this works. Um, I make this kind of image in a few different projects. So you'll see it appear later as a method. Um, in this case, in this particular case, I walk along the coastline. Actually, the most important thing to me about this project is getting to do it. I like the results. I mean, they're important to me too, but I wouldn't ever sort of send somebody to do this work that would make it way less fun and way less interesting. I don't actually like the beach very much. I'm not a beach person naturally. Um, and I, but I felt like I needed to walk the whole length of the Orange Coast, not all in one day, um, but over a period of time, just so that I better understood what it was and what it was like. You know, we each have our favorite beaches and I now know all of the beaches and can you know, point you to, I, I do a little, test with guests is like, what kind of beach do you want? Do you want one with cliffs? Do you want one with you know, surfing? And I can tell them each one that um, has those characteristics. So I walk the beach, here's the Newport coast or the Newport beach beach. Um, and you know, pick a distributed set of locations that are both evenly, relatively evenly distributed, but also have some kind of interesting characteristic. Um, and then there's a bit of a narrowing process. Um, so I pick the ones that are a little darker um, are the ones that ultimately made their way into the image. 
in this case, I'm shooting a panoramic image in 360 degrees. I'm capturing the, you know, a full panorama looking out at the ocean in the center. And I'm standing as close as I can to where the, the at the particular tidal moment where the water is crossing, the tripod's kind of stuck in the water and the water is crossing it. It's also, I do like to contrive things that are fun. I get to basically walk in the water for months um, capturing these images. Um, and many of us will recognize some of these locations in Newport. Maybe some of them are unfamiliar. They're all organized around the water and the horizon. Here we are at Crystal Cove, no, at um, uh, Corona del Mar. And this is my favorite one. This is um, the north edge of Crystal Cove where we have a, a tide pool volunteer who's, who's there to, and he, I did ask permission for, he's really, really close to the camera actually, like a foot away from the camera. So trying to capture him and various people and he's, he's helping people understand the landscape and also to some degree protecting it from people taking things. In a longer presentation of this work, I'll start to talk about the sublime. The sublime is a kind of idea of, of awe we might find in nature. And there's something sublime about these images. I'm most, like most artists, I'm a little bit anti-sublime um, in some ways, or maybe sublime, uh, tired of sublime, and thus don't show these images themselves, uh, though I find them undeniably, you know, kind of beautiful on their own. Um, where they, how they get combined into this more complex composition, so we just line up the horizons and the occupied space kind of collects along the side and then the space of the water in the center. And we start to see a more complicated presentation uh, you know, of a space. I'm also interested in the fact that a single photograph, a standard photographic problem is the fact that you can only take one, you know, a single photo only captures so much. It's a split second in time, not even a split second. It's framed in a particular way. This is an attempt to stretch photography into something a little bit more, um, more encompassing, not all encompassing, but more encompassing to make a single image that can represent more than just one position in space, one position in time, and one person's experience of those two characteristics. You can tell we're in the pandemic with some you know, mask wearing on the, on the, um, the pier and so on. So in the show, this project faced a sculpture uh, described here as a scale model of the landform it faces. Um, this is a project called Marching Cubes that I can't talk about today, um, the, the component parts, uh, a longstanding project where I've made a kit of parts, somewhat ironically for the ocean, 3D printed plastic parts. Um, were they chopped up, they would probably wind up in the ocean. I'm very careful not to do that and have a whole kind of ecological program designed to mitigate the impacts of the creation of this work. Um, but in the most recent versions of assembling this kit of parts, I'm making landforms. And this is where the show starts to become a little less recognizable to people who are familiar with Orange County. You know, you, you know the coast, you're probably familiar with the Santa Ana River. Um, what might not immediately stand out is the shape of its watershed, the kind of boundary, you know, the boundary of the area that flows into the Santa Ana River and to the ocean through it. And of course, all of it's, and the Santa Ana River is a very complicated condition. Those of you that have studied it or know anything about it, I mean, we have moved it around and, and dammed it and, and, you know, Newport Beach was once one of its mouths and is no longer and so on. So there's, again, a whole interesting conversation we could have about that. But this is from the uh, Santa Ana watershed. E, what does P stand for? Um, power, watershed and Power Authority? Anyone know that? Is that, does that have that right? Anyways, the, the water district uh, that is responsible for this watershed, each water district has its own name, usually named after the, the waters that are the source uh, of, of our waters, um, the water we drink. Um, what I've done in this case is taken the watershed watershed's um, volume. And one of the things that's interesting to me about our watershed in just a kind of pure geeky mathematical way is, you know, it's an, it's a, an edge that splits this what the edge that splits this watershed from the adjacent one is is a kind of high point it's a local high point that surrounds the entire watershed otherwise the water would flow the other way um so geometrically this turns out to be something that can be exploited and we end up with a kind of container you know that we're all inside one of the complications of the santa ana watershed is this is this tongue 
that sticks out historically the you know the all of orange counter was a floodplain for this river and that's no longer the case and so I, in this i'm very specifically representing the current santa Ana watershed as it's contained by channelized infrastructure that basically starts when i have this amazing this really large laser pointer here there's a right here this is the prado dam recently repainted with with a bicentennial um painting and beyond the Prado Dam, it starts to become a little bit more, what we might call more natural um, the, in, in the way it connects to, and this is Mount Baldy on the left, um, San Gorgonio in the far distance and San Jacinto. So the three high points of Southern California all connect to the Santa Ana watershed and other watersheds via their summits. What, my, what this project does is it turns it into a kit of parts kind of akin to Lego and provides me with instructions to build it. It's been vertically exaggerated quite a bit in order to be kind of an interesting geometry, um, but it's accurate in the sense that what you see is this is Saddleback here, this is Baldi, San Gorgonio, and San Jacinto with, you know, and each of those tallest points, of course, have multiple watersheds that they're flowing into on each side. I'm not talking much about the fact that I'm ultimately a computer artist and you'll see the sort of iconography of computers here present the pixels and the squares and the kind of Cartesian geometry. That's what Marching Cubes is origin is and the video project I'll show you next has that quality as well. So I'm trying to create a kind of conversation. It's a bit unnatural to take ecology and fit it through a computer graphics algorithm in this case that turns it into abstracted geometry. So in the room, we had the Orange Coast along one wall, and the tongue of the Santa Ana River is actually located in the correct location between Huntington Beach and Newport Beach. That's sort of visible here. Um, let's see, there's the tongue, and not quite visible, but it's sticking out and it's kind of near the wall here. And the opportunity in this space was to try to create a conversation between all four walls so on the opposite walls, the short walls in this case, are two films that are actually two channels of a single film um, that represent a cross section of the landform moving from sea level to summit and back again. I'm gonna have to give a very short explanation of what I mean by that. Um, what happens in this film, which is 10 hours long, thus I won't show it to you, um, or even one minute of it, um, is a, a colleague, a, a poetry collaborator and I rode our bikes from the mouth of the river to the highest place you can ride your bike to and then hike to the summit and then back again. It's about a three day trip, um, depending on how you do it in the most direct way possible. And for me, again, it's this experience of being in the watershed that matters. I, I, the results are important, but without actually doing it, I wouldn't develop that kind of new understanding that I'm seeking. And then the question is simply how to br bring that back to an audience. So this is the trip. Um, and this is the trip on the Marching Cubes thing. Um, not nearly that steep though, thankfully. Uh, and these are some of the images. We strapped ourselves up with cameras as, as the kids do today. This is a GoPro trip, if you're familiar with GoPros. Um, people use these to capture their snowboarding or cycling adventures, and this was no different, although the, you know, the, the, the rigor of it was slightly different. We're, we're capturing a minute every 10 seconds um, across the entire cross section and catching things like you may recall the the 10 cities uh, up in orange um this is the california aqueduct crossing the santa Ana watershed one of the most interesting kind of hydrological moments i can think of um kind of unre not unrelated but not in fact the same water district uh, this is the road to the forest falls which is on the shoulder of san gorgonio which is the high point of Southern California. Um, and this, I believe, is the top. It was a bit big, flat, sometimes snowy place, probably still snowy this season. And, um, and then we took the footage and processed it in a way that it became completely illegible as a trip. So this is what the film looks like. Um, but what happens across 10 hours and what the viewer, what, what I'm intending the viewer to experience is this shift from illegibility to legibility. So at various moments in time, the film is totally pixelated to the point of complete abstraction, kind of akin to modern painting uh, in, in some form. 
but as the film progressed and the music you heard in the in the kind of promotional video is from the films the music is also decaying and undecaying in the same way music courtesy a graduate of our icit program in the arts um there's a moment where the film suddenly becomes and i'll see tell me when you think you know what you see and we're Okay, then there's, yeah, so there it is, right? It's like, there's sort of a, somewhere in there, like abstract, not abstract, and then not definitely not abstract. There's actually very few pixels here. I mean, at about 200 by 400 pixels, we can start to resolve something recognizable. One of the biggest laments I have about this project is I had a grant from the UCI Brain Initiative to work with a neuroscientist to try to study when humans begin to register legibility and the pandemic kind of killed this project. We, we couldn't actually work together. Um, and, and then the show came down. We had intended to study people at the show and, and had permission. And, and then of course, nobody could see the show. So that became very hard. But we're at the parking lot. We're at the end of the bike ride and the start of the walking um, at a kind of piece of infrastructure. And also the end of the infrastructure, right? Where we still have the blue line, blue painted lines of the parking lot and kind of signs. And beyond here, we enter into what we might understand to be a purer form of nature. Okay, last project from this, this show. Um, I'm gonna be very quick about this one, although by all means, ask me about it later. Um, essentially the same method as the first project, but applied to housing in Irvine. Uh, Irvine is, is famous worldwide for being one of the most successful master plan communities. And I say that with no judgment at all. I mean, it, 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 it simply is that, whether you like that or don't like that, and you'll, you'll probably be familiar with polarized reactions to Irvine. It's this kind of beautiful place, but there's a lot of sameness. The, the master planning results in each neighborhood has the same house over and over again. This is University Park. Um, this is Northwood. And so what I'm doing here, instead of applying it to the coast, is I'm simply lining up eight examples of the same house. Um, this one actually has a Trump and Biden sign in it somewhere. If, if we have the in the full print, there's, and there's a Biden sign and a Trump sign and different parts of the road. People are surprisingly amenable to this. There's this person in their garage working and people always come out and ask what I'm doing. And then I tell them and, and they're never interested in the artwork. Um, consistently do not want to see the end result, even though, even, even if I offer, but, um, which is, you know, is interesting too. Um, this is in Turtle Rock. So it's not just housing, uh, you know, single family homes is a kind of housing complex where it's organized around these planters, these little circles, um, and so on. And I'll, I'll unpack one for you that you may recognize from our soon to be demolished Los Lomas. Anybody live in Los Lomas at any point? This is our, uh, our, our original campus, one of our original campus housing complexes. It's not always easy to find the organizing feature, but one of them is this gate, right? This sort of archway that you pass through. You'll notice I have to flip it sometimes to make it work. So the Las Lomas writing is backwards here. Um, this one wasn't actually in the show, but the, uh, and then whew, they come together as one. And for me, this is simply a more accurate representation of Las Lomas. I mean, Las Lomas is a repeated, the architects of Las Lomas are actually trying to make it seem complicated. That's one of the architectural goals of that complex. It's not, you know, the repetition's not so obvious, but it's there. And it, and, you know, it's kind of a vehicle for unpacking that and asking questions about it. So taken together, the work expresses the commonalities and contradictions of Orange County's overlapping ecologies, or so I say, at least, and we can debate that afterwards, if you like. Um, okay, we're actually doing all right. The project get faster. Well, way before I lived here, I lived in Toronto, Ontario, and I have a, an enduring fascination with these places. You know, the, the statement is the places we live. And while the, you know, the arch, I'm an architect originally, and the architect in me thinks these are, wow, look at these great big buildings. And then the person in me is like, why would you ever want to build that thing? Who wants to live in that? And, and, and really that question, that tension between a, a, an architect's desire to produce these fabulous forms in the world and, and, a, and a kind of real person's confusion about, I mean, is that in fact a good idea? And, and yet across North America, this is simply Toronto's version of it. These buildings are incredibly common. In, in Toronto's case, I'm just going to fast forward through these. This is a kind of analysis of the um, building inventory in Toronto itself and then greater Toronto um, 
this is a million people. This is one quarter of the city's population. This pattern's not unique to Toronto, although it's somewhat more exaggerated there than it is here. Um, so we have this standing problem in North America and elsewhere, and, and, a, and a kind of new problem in some other parts of the world where we've built these enormous buildings at enormous rates. In North America, the peak is typically in around 1970. We often think there's a lot of construction today, but there was a lot more construction in 1970. Um, and I take pictures of them. Um, and I take pictures of them in a way that's trying to not neither vilify them nor valorize them necessarily. I'm trying to kind of go right down the middle. It's a little bit of a hard problem because of course it's entirely subjective. It depends on what you think of the building. Um, but there's always a little ingredient. So this is an image that I think is, is emblematic. It's kind of oppressive on some level, but then there's these kids, right? And they're having a great time and they're part of its ecology. This is their neighborhood. This is where they play. And, 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 and again, I kind of reinforce this point, but the experience of taking the image is what matters the most to me. It takes a couple of hours to set something like this up. I have to get to know these kids. They come, you know, trying to push my tripod over and, and we have to have a relationship in order to, to, to make this possible. I'm, I'm a kind of interloper in their neighborhood. Um, and sometimes the adjacent ecology is more obvious. In this case, a lot of the Toronto tower buildings are alongside ravines that have, you know, literal nature in them. And one of the questions that I have to answer in the images is like, well, how many deer should there be in the image itself? I picked two, could have been four, could have been one. Um, I think one of them got photoshopped out for, for some reason. Okay, I, I, I actually don't wanna talk about that project. I wanna talk about this project, which is its, its kind of final extension. Um, I was working with an anthropologist who pointed out, well, you like these concrete high rises from the seventies in Toronto. Let me tell you about one that's on the shore of Tuco or the Great Slave Lake in the Northwest Territories in Canada, which we expect will look like this, and it does. This is the frozen edge of the Great Slave Lake. This is the seventh largest lake in, in the world. Ninth, it's a big lake, doesn't matter which one. Um, but of course people live there and this is the same photo, but backing up a hundred feet. Um, and we forget when we think of the Arctic that there are people there and they live not unlike us and have to have playgrounds for their children and live in buildings that might look like the buildings we're used to elsewhere. But this one's a real curiosity because there is no, we could argue there's a good reason for these buildings in dense cities and, and, you know, and I believe in that to, to a large degree, but there's no really good reason to build this building here and it has a story. So I've spent the last 10 years trying to figure out, find a way to unpack its story in print, um, but also as a film and you are, the beneficiaries of a show that I have up right now um, that I don't have as many images of because it's still up, but I want to show you, I'm gonna read because it'll save me some time from its artist statement. I spent much of my career looking at tower apartment buildings, mostly ones structured of reinforced concrete. The buildings, the material, and their ethos emerged in the early modern period, seemingly without precedent, and have since proliferated beyond our wildest imagination. Mackenzie Place examines an exceptional instance of this building type. Anthropologist Lindsay Bell, a former resident of Hay River in Canada's Northwest Territories, introduced me to the town's high rise, it's in quotation marks here, and thus for you. Um, that's what they call it. It's called the high rise. There's only one. Everyone knows what you're talking about. This is a lone concrete tower built in 1975, far from its typical urban home. In 2013, we began a collaboration focused on this town and its tower. In 2023, this work has come to fruition in its most comprehensive forms to date. Uh, my art installation, Mackenzie Place, and her book, Under Pressure, um, Diamond Mining and Everyday Life in Northern Canada. The installation is anchored by a multi-channel film that immerses you in the inexorably evolving landscape around the building, sometimes beautiful, sometimes banal. Readings from Lindsay's book tell the building's story and the stories of those who have made it their home. Large illuminated prints depict the building um, as it is experienced, simultaneously omnipresent and ignored, a monument that nobody asked for. I gotta catch up my slides here. So this is the, this is the film. It's a, it's a little hard to show you a film because it's a four channel film that you're meant to be immersed in, but I will try in a moment. Um, and these are the adjacent prints 
This is really just two prints in the show. One that uses this method of collapse that you've seen previously, and another that does the opposite. This is a, this is a, a different method that artificially makes a place look busy. So this is about two hours of time collapsed into a single image. And you can tell because this fellow appears more than once um, and so on. Um, a portfolio of smaller prints, 52 images shot of, in, or from the building, sit below five of Bell's field notebooks, gesturing towards the parallel processes of art and anthropology. Sorry. Frequently prescribed as a panacea for a future that never seems to arrive, tower apartments are simultaneously rational and absurd. For me, they are the ultimate expression and imposition of the architect's doctrinaire mind. For others, they are a symbol of rapacious late capitalism, consuming land and containing bodies in service of financialization. For many, they are home for a while at least. Hay River's tower is now nobody's home, empty after a major fire in 2019. 50 years old and at the end of its conventional service life, it faces an uncertain future, too big to tear down, too costly to repair and high rent if fixed. Mackenzie Place, while specific to Hay River and its circumstances, speaks to the issues faced by all such structures. Okay, so now we're gonna switch. So um, just yesterday, I finished a trailer. So we're gonna show, try, to, try to kind of at least give you a sense for what the film is like. And we'll do that here, if it works. Hey, Rivers. Oh, that's very loud. It's now abandoned for now. Yeah, it's it's empty. But I actually don't know how to turn this down. Right there, there we go. Most visible landmark is a 17 story high rise residential tower the developer named Mackenzie Place. Locals simply call it the high rise. Mackenzie Place looks like many other North American post-war towers built to deal with urbanization. A concrete rectangle with rows of identical windows and balconies and minimal architectural flourishes. If it were in a city, it would likely not catch your attention. With everything else around only one or two stories high, the building looks like it was left here by accident. His eyes run over the perimeter of the scratched, shellacked, wood-paneled elevator walls. We then noticed three thin, dark red streaks on the door close to the bottom. For the rest of that day, everyone will use elevator exchanges to try to piece together what could have happened. Those who sit and smoke at the picnic table out front will get pieces of the story from the property managers who are out watering their struggling plants. One manager repeats the same joke to each passerby. 23 hours of sunshine. You think this shit would grow faster. It was all about the town's big wheels. You know what I mean? The big wheels wanted it and they got it. How can spaces like a transportation community so crucial to national and global economic markets be considered not the real North? How can a good segment of the working class be considered not the real a river? How can a building that can be seen from anywhere in the community be interpreted as separate from it? It became clear through countless interviews that these concerns were not interpreted as failures of expedited resource development, but of the building itself. I received a photo of billows of black smoke coming from the high rise via text in March of 2019. The high rise had a massive fire. All 150 tenants were evacuated. The local newspaper estimates that over a dozen people, primarily indigenous residents, including some elderly people, have yet to find stable housing. After the fire, the high-rise was purchased by what a local newspaper described as a sophisticated Western Canadian company. The purchase of the high-rise is the latest iteration of infrastructural prospecting. Past failures become future extractive opportunities for those who can afford them. The investors told local news that their aim was to help address the region's housing shortage. 
but just who will be housed in the next iteration of the high rise is unclear. As of March, 2023, no work has been done on the property. We're gonna talk about one more project for five minutes as quickly as I can. So this is the installation of McKenzie Place. Um, you know, it's kind of immersive. It takes an hour in this case. And, and the, um, this is a first in my work in a way the the text is literally excerpted from, I, bought the, I brought the book for you. So the text is not mine. Um, it's from an ethnography. Um, so it, it, an anthropologist might recognize this sort of style of writing. This is an ethnographic where we're, we're hearing people in our own voices um, and this became, this is actually kind of jarring artistically in a way to sort of set up that type of evaluation of something and a kind of visual presentation of something. And that's what's of interest to us. So we're going to keep showing this film in various venues um, down the road. Okay, we promised some Burns Pinion. I'm going to skip past. So I'm the executive director of the Beale Center for Art and Technology. And this is what it looks like. Everybody been to the Beale Center? I have to show you the Beale Center. Yay, that's amazing. That's a, and if you haven't been to the Beale Center, I highly recommend it. We show work at the intersection of art and technology. These are kind of two typical shows, computational poetics, difference machines, technology and identity and contemporary art. I'm not here to talk to you about those things. I'm here to briefly talk to you about a new initiative at the Beale Center where, now this is a 25 year old institution. We're approaching our 25th anniversary and, um, there was a time historically when conversations about technology and about ecology were sort of closer together. I, I hesitate to invoke Stuart Brand. He has a complicated legacy, but this was back in the 70s. People who were interested in computers were equally interested in, in kind of getting back to the land and various other things. And, and that spirit has, you know, we've sort of separated those two things. And often people who are interested in nature are you know, almost not interested in technology. Um, I'd like to bring these conversations closer together again. So we've been hosting what we call the Beale Center for Art and Ecology in the, in the form of a speaker series, um, some events and some shows. So recently we had a graduate student show, um, you know, focused on expanded ecologies in the space. Um, and the project I'd like to very briefly, um, at least just tell you about is a physical expansion out into the desert. This is where we are. This is our little red box. This is campus. Let's zoom out, keep zooming out. Here we are in Southern California. And then let's zoom back in into this is a uh, um, this is San Gorgonio, so not not totally unrelated to my other work. Um, this is Yucca Valley down here. This is the Pioneer Town Road, and this is Pioneer Town out near Joshua Tree. This is called Skyline Ranch, and if we go there, we're at a site called the Burns Pinion uh, Nature Reserve, part of the UC Natural Reserve System. Three hundred acres of of high desert you know, kind of the interface of the Mojave and the mountain, the transverse range, mountain ecologies, um, donated by the Burns family, starting in 1978. And then, you know, leading up until the, just recently, in fact, the houses themselves were donated to the university. It's a fabulous place and highly recommend you find any reason to go check it out. Um, if you've been to Anza Borrego, which is a more commonly visited site, it's, it's not the same climate, but it's a similar kind of, it's a house in the desert. And maybe the difference is this one hasn't had the resources to be converted into a, a, a visitor's center um, with a live-in caretaker. Um, what my students and I are, I've started working on is, as Steve mentioned, there's a building there that looked like, let's skip ahead, this, it's full of stuff. Nothing inherently wrong with being full of stuff. It was surrounded with stuff too. Um, this is 25 years of both Burns family stuff and, and kind of science experiments and mostly Burns family stuff, actually. This is all vestiges of the original inhabitants and, um, and all of their materials. But stuffed full of stuff, it can't be used for much else. And, and so over a period of a couple of years now, I've been cleaning it up and trucking. This is the UCI art truck. Um, trucking stuff to recycling depots and disposing of things, materials that we deemed that, you know, couldn't really be used for any kind of project. This is a 40 yard dumpster we arranged or um, that the care that the UCI nature manager arranged for us. And um, sometimes you just have to kind of pull things out of the walls. And we're, we've gotten it to about here and the next steps. And we're now making art there. Um, but the idea is to make this into a multi-purpose facility that has no particular, again, the, the just setting up experiments where artists and ecologists work alongside each other. And 
um, this is actually a picture from a trip just two weeks ago. We brought undergrads out there. This is a paper making experiment using materials found on site. Um, we made cyanotypes and then we had an ecology PhD student come out and teach the students about leaves and how to how to sort of study them and, in, and then also inject them into with chemicals and make art out of them. Um, and it's meant to be a kind of open ended space. Ultimately, we're going to put lights and windows back in. So if you happen to be out there, it is currently windowless still. So Jessica, we still have to still need your help installing windows. The windows are still stacked up against the wall. Um, but they will go back in. And the idea here is not to renovate the building. We're not trying to turn it into a whole building. We're trying to turn it into a space people could use with this kind of minimum and the minimum infrastructure to my mind is, is lights and you know kind of a windbreak. It's very windy out there. And the glass that had been in place was half broken um, and kind of impossible to, to, it was too dangerous to fix essentially. My last uh, minute here, I just wanna talk about one more thing. Um, this is Bruce Burns and his family and th their family uh, lived out there starting around this era when Mr. Burns made a fortune inventing a chip clip or clothesline, well, was a clothesline clip and then later became a chip clip. These are, this is a picture of them on Etsy. You can still buy them. I actually don't know the scale of the fortune. I wish I did. Like some, but some reasonably large amount of money was raised inventing this thing. And in the most curious of coincidences, or maybe not, the symbol of the Etsy assembly of chip clips matches the Pacific Standard Time logo. And I want to close by telling you about a, something that has nothing to do with me beyond my administrative capacity at the Beale Center, but that you should all know about if you're interested in science. Um, in 2024, the Getty Institute will be hosting Pacific Standard Time art science in LA. And I'll just let their promotional video do its work. If only we all had BBDO working for us. Biotechnology, artificial intelligence, pandemics, climate change, environmental justice. These are the issues of our age. Pacific Standard Time, the iconic cultural event, will weave together science and art to confront today's urgent problems and shape new visions of our past and future through curiosity, creativity, and community. Join the conversation as Pacific Standard Time unfolds. So we'll have a Pacific Standard Time show at the Beale in 2024 called uh, Complexity, uh, has the word complexity in it, name is escaping me at the moment, um, but there'll be 75 institutions all across California um, uh, having art science events, and this is unprecedented. There hasn't been this large a collection of art and science events in any city anywhere um, ever. So be sure to check these out. They're, they're, there's going to be lots of marketing for it. And the Getty has a bazillion oil dollars to spend on this. So um, well, it's at least at least 2024. So it'll it'll be all of 2024, I think. Um, they won't all happen at the same time. Ours will be in fall 2024. Thank you. Uh, why don't we take a few minutes of questions and maybe like 10 minutes or so and then let people get on their way. have any questions
And I think your question, uh, a great question, a lot of questions, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of questions. The, the, so I will, my, my diagrams were me having a thought experiment yesterday. I was, my original training is as an engineer. Um, so I, and in, in some ways, a lot of my artwork also responds to the kind of somewhat limited perspective that engineering brings, as you say, as an applied science. I mean, we're gonna solve problems with these tools, but the way that the problem solving, I'm gonna to try to answer, you know, also for the sake of other people may have questions because a lot of things to talk about. Um, I think all of the questions you ask point to the value of ecology as a way to understand the things that we have made. They, they, they're all systems problems. The, you know, the high rise is good, the high rise is bad. The high rise is good here, the high rise is bad there. You know, self-driving cars are gonna save Los Angeles, self-driving cars are gonna eat themselves. I mean, they, they, they all point to a, a, a shortage of, of, of variables under consideration, you know, that we're, we, we have such a tough time thinking of problems in holistic and systemic ways. We think of them as one thing, or, you know, I don't want a high rise in my backyard and, or I wanna live in a high rise because I can afford it. So, you've, you know, in each of those things, you're setting up kind of maybe two parameters. I don't have, as an artist, of course, I don't have a solution or, or even maybe the, the intention of trying to solve the problem. I, I, but asking the question, how do I represent? <laughs> yes. Well, and I think in a way the I mean, in some ways that's a, a little bit of an impossible question because the choice of manner is my artistic choice in the moment. And given a different set of experiences and variables, I might have chosen something differently. But I guess I would answer that I love the question because it provokes me to try to capture a different set of things. I mean, even in in image making, making projects that try to collapse more than just one moment in time and space, you're still very limited. And, and, and that's, I think also speaks to this kind of inability of the human mind to comprehend more than a couple of things at a time. Um, but I am very receptive to the challenge of trying to create artwork that somehow speaks to as many of those things as possible. Um, so I thank you for the question. Mr. Barker. I mean, I can try. I, I'm resistant to the idea that the results are objective. I, I think they're still subjective. I mean, they, they, I think there are two qualities that I'm chasing in each project that's common. One is that to try to tackle a conversation that isn't being tackled by artists typically. And I think the, the, the Hay River project or the, the McKenzie Place project is, is very kind of, I mean, this is the kind of thing that I try to show this to art audiences. Like, why would you do that? Like, that doesn't, this doesn't glue, you know, glom onto any other art practice or art interest I can think of. And that's exciting to me. That suggests that there's, this, whether it's objective or not, that there's some, we're sort of expanding a conversation through the work that, you know, there are a lot of people thinking about the problem of high rises. This is not, this is, you know, the thousands and thousands of scholars and engineers and, and, in, and a part of the project, part of the, my work that I don't discuss is how I interface with those audiences. The, the imagery of towers is used by professionals who are interested in the problem all the time, because there are no other people taking pictures like that of these buildings. They're either terrible pictures and it's a really like a picture deliberately designed to make it ugly or, or a picture that's, you know, a real estate photo and, you know, that's selling the building. So that's been interesting actually, that, that the works can be used in a quasi objective way to present a bit of a neutral perspective on the subject. Um, but I don't know, I think, I think, and maybe, maybe I'll end on the thought that I, 
am sometimes dissatisfied with how I can take those experiences and make them into work. I mean, I make, like many of us, I work in the way that I know how to work and it's evolving slowly and different and new methods and new, the film is a somewhat new way of working for me, but there's a, you know, you can only move so quickly. And, and I wish I could better channel what I think is the most valuable experience, which is kind of being in a place and, and, and kind of communing with it in, in a way that's maybe different than the ecological way of communing with a place or the conventional artistic way of documenting a place. Thank you. And thank you everybody for, oh, okay. I, this is up to Steven actually. I'm, I'm, I have no, I'm in no hurry. So one more question, sure. And I'll stick around too. If people have questions, I'm in no hurry. You're keeping me from a cabinet meeting. Um, I, I, I will happily skip as much of that as possible. So, um, It's all in my office. Um, um, it's all for sale. No, it's actually not all for sale, but you know, the prints are for sale if anybody's interested. You know, what, in the ecology of art making, the scarce resource is space to show. And one of the things that you know, I'm trying to do at the Beale Center is you know, just increase the frequency with which we show things. Unfortunately, you, you think that, I don't know, art shows are three months long. Um, that means there's only four art shows a year in this space. There's only four artists who benefit from the use of the space. So I have no current prospect of showing this in Orange County or even in Los Angeles again soon. I mean, I of course would love to, but even with all the privilege of being an art professor and in the university system, there's still a, you know, I'm still scrambling for space to show things. Um, it's, it's really, it's a really interesting art problem. And, and the reason why art shows don't turn over more frequently isn't because art galleries are fixated on being up for three months. In some ways it's just the cost. Each show costs so much money. You take your money and you distribute it across the year and that's how many shows you can have. Um, but it's, so it's a, I, I would love to show it again, but I don't have any plans. Uh, one more and go ahead. We have it, and the, in suburban ecologies, that opportunity just kind of went away when we weren't able to interact. In Mackenzie Place, on the anthropology side, one of the attractions of working with an anthropologist is the you know direct nature of ethnography is to work with people, engage their you know re receive their stories and trans and do as little translating as possible. And and a, a side project that we had was, and what we're still planning to do is to bring the project there. I'm very interested in what a person in Hay River thinks of this artwork and especially in how it's expressed. Frankly, it's currently described for the purpose of Southerners as they, as we call them. Um, it, you know, it's been put in art terms. It's, it's been made kind of friendly to an academic audience. Um, but there's, I'm not, that's not the piece I want them to, I would just want them to hang out in the film. And, and so far um, a few people who live there have come to the show in Toronto and they stay the longest. They just, it just never, I think two things seem to happen. It's never occurred to them that this is, art worthy. And it sort of speaks to the way art is set up in the world as this kind of, well, we only make art about things that are valuable. Um, of course, that's not true, but that's often how it's perceived. Um, so I'm, I'm happy about that. But also they just love the idea that this is a place they know far better than I do. Like I lived in that building and, and, and actually that's the experience I have with the tower work in general. It's like people, it's like, I lived in that apartment in that building. And then there's a whole kind of it, it, and it rarely seems to be negatively received, which of course that would be valid too. I haven't had as much of that. Um, but we did, we also did some experiments with, with actual IRB approval and on the anthropology side of having people, interviewing people and asking them to locate themselves relative to the high rise in this town, like make a, make a drawing. I, I wasn't able to incorporate that into the show. Um, we actually lost some of the footage, but this is this wonderful and you know, kind of drawing and, and they, 
you know, show me where you are in Hay River relative to the tower. And they make these fabulous drawings that are all very different from each other, depending on what they do and how they, even in a very small place, you know, you still only inhabit an extremely narrow sliver of, you know, of space. And that's true no matter where you live. Thank you. Well, uh, feel free to grab any food on your way out. Um, and, and Jesse may stick around for a few minutes if you like. And thanks again for, for being here today. And the postcards on the table you can take home from the show. If anybody didn't get a postcard, have more. Um, the, I'll put them. Well, I should say the Beale Center is on campus. So oh, the Beale Center yeah. itself, and then the, the Burns Band facility okay. is only kind of open. It's it's not open to the general public and yeah. stuff, you know, although it can be arranged. So close, and, and even there, I mean, the elevation change enormous amount of cost. And that's all like when you're in Palm Springs, you're, you're right below it. There's two ways to get there. They're both
Thank you. 